Jason Voorhees wasn't the killer in either the first or fifth Friday the 13th movie. And spoilers for the Scooby episodes coming up, too. Today, Don Adams joins Scooby and the gang. The gang are enjoying a tour of movie star homes in the Hollywood Hills when they encounter actor and entertainer Don Adams, who is now self-employed as the episode's titular exterminator. After his truck breaks down, they come to his aid by giving him a lift to his next job, clearing a massive infestation from a creepy mansion from which over a dozen previous exterminators purportedly failed to return. The late Don Adams was probably best known for playing bumbling spy Maxwell Smart in the TV series Get Smart, which aired its final episode three years prior to his appearance here on the new Scooby-Doo movies. Sadly, Adams found himself typecast, and it was difficult for him to get regular work as an actor, despite hosting his own short-lived television series two years later. It would take a decade until he would play what those of my generation would likely consider his defining role. That'll teach you not to fool with the fastest exterminator in the West. That moth is still very much alive. What did he spray it with? Aquanet? Gee, I wish I could see the inside of a movie star's home. You would? Tell you what, kids. How'd you like to be my assistants? As a business owner, Don Adams should know he's required to have the gang fill out employment paperwork before starting work. Right? The bank is selling this house, and I have to exterminate before it can be sold. Mr. Chumley does not wish exterminators on his property. That's fine. We'll be back later with a sheriff's deputy and a court order. You go get a court order, and I'll sue your ass for wrongful prosecution. That was weird. In this episode, Adams and the gang run afoul of Lauren Chumley and Otto, a down-on-his-luck old movie actor known for his many on-screen disguises and his loyal Germanic butler. That's Horror Hill! The home of the old horror film star, Lauren Chumley! They are all pictures of the great Lauren Chumley in his most frightening roles. He was known as the man with a million faces. This name is no doubt referencing famous silent film horror star Lon Chaney, often referred to as the man with a thousand faces due to his makeup skills and ability to play many different characters, including the Phantom of the Opera and this guy. Chumley and Otto try to sabotage... Sabotage? How? When? Adams attempts to exterminate the pests in their creepy old mansion to delay the bank from foreclosing so the two of them can complete what they hope will be a comeback film for the aged actor. Like most Scooby villains, they resort to costumes and supernatural shenanigans to scare away Adams and his helpers. Wait a minute. An old-time movie star known for being a master of disguise dressing up in his old roles to avoid losing his home. Why does that sound... familiar? This is almost the exact same scheme devised by Zalia Z. Fairchild in the Sandy Duncan episode, although in that one, Fairchild resorted to scare tactics to prevent a film from completing, while here Chumley and Otto resorted to scare tactics to make sure their film is completed. The design score gets docked at least two points for such a blatant lack of originality. So what about how easy it would be to get caught? Chumley and Otto were two elderly men hiding out in a single mansion, not a film studio. Unlike Fairchild, who had the run of acres of ground that would afford numerous places to hide, the two villains here did not have anywhere near the space to spread out. Like most estates featured in the scooby doo universe, this one had its fair share of secret doors and passageways, and it was only a matter of time before Adams or the gang stumbled into the one that would lead to Chumley and Otto's hidden film set. Unoriginal and easy to get caught. So, what about how profitable it would be? Eh, this one is hard to pin down. Obviously, if Chumley and Otto were able to complete their film, they'd have at least a small chance of finding a studio that might be impressed enough to employ the actor. However, this was long after the heyday of the Universal Monster series, and horror films were in a bit of a decline. Barring the occasional hit like The Exorcist or Rosemary's Baby, it wouldn't be until the mid to late 1970s and the boom of the slasher era that theater seats would start getting filled again by people wanting to be frightened. 
At best, Chumley would be cast as the creepy old man warning the teenagers to stay away from the scary place where the last group of teens were brutally murdered. Too bad you can't finish making the movie by tomorrow. I could, if I had people to help me. We'd be glad to help you, wouldn't we, gang? Good thinking, kids. You can finish the movie while I finish exterminating. It takes a professional crew days to complete just a few scenes of a film, and a group of non-union teenagers and an old man are going to finish in one day? This must be how sci-fi gets all their content. The episode ended with the gang helping Chumley and Otto finish their film while Adams completed his extermination job, but let's be brutally honest here. Fred and the rest were just keeping the two old men busy while Adams got his work done, and once that was finished, somebody would be calling the authorities to come and take two senior citizens to a rest home while the bank sold the mansion to developers. At least Chumley would probably have been housed at the Motion Picture Hospital, a real-world charitable institution established for retired industry actors who couldn't afford their own care. Poor Otto, though, who was just a butler, would more than likely be left to fend for himself. Wow. That got dark. Anyway, the two of them get a design score of just one out of five. Their plan wasn't original or profitable, and they had very little chance to avoid getting caught. Almost every disguise used by Chumley and Otto was featured in an earlier Scooby episode, sometimes even down to the character models. First, there were the usual three, Dracula, the Wolfman, and Frankenstein. As seen here, the character designs of Dracula and the Wolfman are both mostly reused from Gaggle of Galloping Ghosts in Season 1 of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You?, while the Frankenstein design isn't immediately recognizable, that may be because it is as generic as you can get. They didn't even give him any bolts for his neck. Making his third appearance in a Scooby episode is Mr. Hyde, which is also the second time this character model was used, which was likely based on this guy. There's a creepy old man who frightens Shaggy and Scooby, which incidentally is not chumly without makeup. It is, however, the reused character model of Swampy Pete from the second Globetrotters appearance, an episode itself already notorious for reusing character models. Though not the same as featured in either the Black Knight or Davy Jones episodes, there is yet another suit of armor to terrorize the gang, as well as a living trophy of some sort of... bird... thing? We go in there! This one is particularly puzzling because the figure is only half of a creature, meaning logically the rest of whoever was wearing the costume would be sticking out of the back on the other side of the wall where anyone could see them. Shaggy and Scooby even ran through the door directly under where the villain's body should have been dangling. Then we have this guy, who is clearly based on the Gill Man from Creature from the Black Lagoon, though at least it seemed to be an original character model that wasn't featured in any earlier Scooby episode. It's also extremely impressive for Chumley to be dressed in that outfit underwater because the original movie Gill Man costume needed a professional swimmer and stuntman to be able to move while submerged, as well as to hold his breath for as long as he did during filming. Finally, there's whatever this outfit is. The Scooby fan site calls it a cat creature, and I can kind of see it, but it's more of an ape than a cat. Also, don't those look like saggy gorilla th Just like the Sandy Duncan episode, the costumes are all over the place here, and it's difficult to come up with a fair rating. While most of them would be considered scary, none of them were that original, and none of them featured any special effects. Or did they? Okay, I got on. Four fingers. That's even. <laughs> I'm staying right here in the elevator. Mm -hmm. Going up. At no point is any of this explained. In other episodes, hands appearing from walls or invisible beings would be written off as merely the work of a film projector. But that's not the case here. Nothing is ever shown that would account for these moments. Even if you argue that since the other costumes were based on old Universal film monsters, it only made sense to include the Invisible Man, 
the invisibility effects in those films were not done through advanced costume or makeup techniques. Today it's easy to use computers to key out colors and add transparency effects, but back in the day it was extremely complicated, requiring technicians to use black matting, special costuming, and compositing multiple shots to achieve the effect seen here. And that's only on film. In real life during shooting, nobody was actually transparent. Lazy writing really makes analyses like this a lot harder than they should be. I'll ignore the disembodied hand and consider the rest just extremely complicated wire work that made the costumes appear to be worn by invisible people, which would make them props and not villain disguises, thus limiting the scoring to only the other outfits I previously discussed. I'm giving Chumley and Otto a 3 out of 5. Though certainly not unique, their costumes do deserve credit for most of them being able to scare the gang and for the villain's ability to so quickly and convincingly swap between them as they did. If you strip away all the trappings of a Scooby-Doo episode, meaning the monster costumes, the eerie location, the bumbling shenanigans of Shaggy and Scooby, and so on, this entire scheme really boils down to an elderly couple doing their best to stay in a home they can no longer afford. Sure, that home was technically a Hollywood mansion, and it may be easy to not sympathize with the wealthy when they hit hard times, but don't forget we're talking about an actor from the early days of the motion picture industry possibly before the Screen Actors Guild was formed, a time when actors were treated almost as indentured servants of the studios. That mansion may have been the only thing left to Chumley, which is even more likely when you consider how dilapidated it was. The aged actor clearly did not have the money for upkeep, and Don Adams was only there in the first place due to the massive pest infestation the property had. Imagine having to live under those conditions. I'm willing to set most of that aside so as to not influence my ranking, but I feel it's important when ultimately deciding on Chumley and Otto's operation score. Oh, come now. Surely you don't believe that silly rumor? That 14 exterminators have entered that house and no one has heard a word from any of them since. As mentioned, Adams is likely not the first exterminator the bank hired to clear up the mansion's pest problem. I say likely because Adams specifically stated that the previous 14 exterminators having gone missing was just a rumor. I accept that explanation because as desperate as Chumley and Otto were to finish their film, I can't see the two of them murdering over a dozen people and successfully covering it all up. As lousy as the LAPD is, even they could be expected to do something after undoubtedly receiving a massive amount of phone calls from family members looking for their missing loved ones. So while I would like to give credit to Chumley and Otto for initially being successful enough to thwart that many exterminators, this is just too vague to accept. I'm going to stick with just their actions dealing with Don Adams and the gang. I joked earlier about Otto demanding a court order before allowing Adams into the house to treat it, but actually that would have been the villain's single best tactic and they completely ignored it. In fact, it's really the only tactic they needed. Granted, I'm unfamiliar with how foreclosure laws work in California, let alone what they were 50 years ago, but typically a homeowner can deny entry to anyone without proper authorization. Technically, even the police, unless they have a warrant signed by a judge. Otto should have simply stood his ground and refused to allow Adams and the gang to enter. If he had done so, Adams would have been forced to return to the bank, explain the situation, then look for his next job. The bank, meanwhile, would then have to start the eviction process required by whatever local court oversaw the neighborhood occupied by Chumley's mansion. Speaking as one with both court filing and property management experience, this could be a long process affording Chumley and Otto all the time they need to finish their film project. Again, I never lived or worked in California, and their civil procedures are likely very different than what I went through back in my mid-twenties, but in general, foreclosures and evictions are measured in months not days. Without a court order, Otto could have just <laughs> slammed the door in Adam's face and that would have been it. This is why banks usually wait until after the property becomes vacant to do cleanup and repairs. <laughs> Very well, come in. This massive miscalculation on the part of Chumley and Otto colors every action they do throughout the rest of the episode. 
nothing they do is necessary, and worse, as Adams and the gang were willingly allowed inside, should any harm have befallen any of them due to the villain's attempts to scare them off, those two would have faced potential criminal action as well as homelessness. Which I suppose might be marginally better if the two of them were at least guaranteed food and shelter inside a prison, rather than be tossed out on the streets. Well, not Chumley, of course. He had the motion picture hospital to fall back on. Not Otto, though. It's a life of cold and dark bridge underpasses for him. Poor Otto. None of their shenanigans really merit much attention, so I'll just end it here by giving Chumley and Otto an operation score of 1.5 out of 5. All of their acts were not only pointless, but could have resulted in needless criminal charges. They still get half a point for being as old as they were, yet still being able to scare a group of meddling teenagers. This leaves the ancient actor and his Bavarian butler a final due score of 1.8 out of 5. And to think that some of those stars were discovered working in a gas station. Really? This is why if you take your dog on a car trip, you keep the window up. Worst dog owners ever. <laughs> you mean movie stars have bugs? Gosh. What's he so happy about? Hey, he thinks he's got one of Lassie's fleet. <laughs> Lassie? What happened to Laddie? Good thing for Scooby, those weren't fire ants. Next time, pick on somebody weaker, like Soldier Uncles. Right on, Velma! Well, I guess it's nice to see the girls stick one to the guys for a change. F 1970s. And now it's on me! Sorry about that. <coughs> I think I was better off with the flea. Adams really does need to get a stronger spray. Surely you don't believe that silly rumor? Don't call me Shirley. Yes? Yes. He was known as the man with a million faces. Also a million termites. I gave the bank my word. And we gave you ours. That's right. Thanks, kids. You'll get half my pay. The bank's paying me ten cents a bug. While numbers can vary, a typical termite infestation can be around 60,000 insects, though numbers exceeding a million is not unheard of. At 10 cents per bug, the bank could be on the hook for anywhere from $6,000 to $100,000 for the job. That's between $40,000 and $700,000 in 2023 money. It would have been far cheaper to simply bulldoze the mansion. Today, pest control companies typically charge under $1,000 for treating termites. That's about $150 in 1973 money. I'm starting to think Don Adams may be the real criminal in this episode. Of course, this does beg the question. How would Adams prove how many bugs he killed? How would he be able to access all the insect carcasses buried in the walls or underground? And how would the bank verify the kills? Would he bring them to the local branch in a giant garbage bag, spread them on the floor, and a bunch of tellers would start counting? This is why exterminators aren't typically paid by the bug. Got him! That's 60 cents. Wow, that's fast money! Oh, apparently it's on the honor system, because banks are famous for just taking the word of their clients and vendors. Oh, I guess that does happen sometimes. Wait, what the fuck? You saw him just pull the tank right through his chest, right? That's like the lipstick scene with Linnea Quigley at Night of the Demons. In which architectural location shall we commence with our anti-lepidopteran activities? How's that again? She said, where do you think we ought to start debugging? 
Another point for the Velma is a smug know-it-all faction of the Scooby fandom. Wait a minute. It says here, spray may be irritating to skin. Wear a protective covering. I'm glad at least one person handling all these dangerous chemicals actually takes the time to read the warning labels. Perhaps being a smug know-it-all has its benefits. <laughs> There's one of the enemy now. What is it? A Stereoopticus myodopta, more commonly known as the squirt bug. That's not a real insect. But more importantly, you guys remember that Scooby is drowning, right? 1,500 hours, 32 minutes, sighted bug, sank, sank. This was a reference to a famous message sent by a U.S. Navy pilot at the beginning of World War II after he allegedly saw and bombed a German submarine off the coast of Canada. As lost as this reference undoubtedly is on modern viewers of Scooby-Doo, I can't help but think it probably went over the heads of most kids watching in 1973 as well. Adams was a veteran of the war, so I wonder if he added that line himself. But I can't swim! <laughs> Do I really need to do a montage? Of all the times Shaggy and Scooby have been shown swimming before, even in this same series? Pink with yellow polka dots. Pink? And here we have the female chinch bug. You can recognize the female because she never puts her hand out before turning. By the 1950s, turn signals were mandatory on United States automobiles, but at the time this episode was produced, the idea of using hand signals while driving would still be known. There was a time in history when you would literally have to stick your arm out of the car window to tell the driver behind you which way you were planning to turn. This was obviously another joke at the expense of women, this time by referencing the old stereotype that they're all lousy drivers. Little exterminator humor there. A little exterminator sexism there. Now all those who think the house is haunted, raise their hands. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. This kind of puts a new perspective on those later Scooby series where Daphne, Shaggy, and Scooby go out on their own. We'll soon be rid of them, won't we? <laughs> That's a movie screen, not a television screen. So how could Chumley in the sea monster suit interact with Otto like that? Did they really go through the hassle of filming the sea monster laughing, developing the film stock at the lab, queuing it up in the projection booth, and timing it to start playing just to match Otto's statement? If so, who the hell were they doing that for? Hey, get me out of this thing! He's in that trunk! And it's floating away! Trunks don't float! Something must be moving it. Bats were moving it. Your trained bats delivering another trunk full of costumes, Mr. Chumley. Really? That's how the writers decided to explain the floating trunk? Even if setting aside the logistics of how bats could be trained in the first place, or even manage to gain any lift when under a heavy piece of furniture that would keep them from being able to fully flap their wings, it would take a lot more bats than shown here to carry that heavy luggage. One study I found estimated that bats could only carry potentially 60 to 80% of their body weight and still maintain flight. We don't know the species of bats shown here, but if we estimate their average weight on the larger size at no more than a quarter of a pound each, that would put their hypothetical carrying capacity at between roughly a sixth and a fifth of a pound each. Even if the trunk was on the lighter end of just 50 pounds, Don Adams by himself probably weighed three times that for his height and body type. You would need anywhere from 1,000 to 1,300 bats at a minimum to have any hope of carrying that much. Even if you allowed them to hold it with their feet and not on their backs so as not to restrict their wing movement. This whole discussion about how small flying creatures would be able to carry large weights reminds me of something. But I can't quite remember what. A swallow carrying a coconut? A hairpin? What else? <laughs> it worked! Chalk up another one for women's lib. 
Right on, Velma. I would like to take a moment to thank my new Patreon members and apologize in advance if I mispronounce any names. Biscuit Valentine. Thank you, Biscuit Valentine. Stella Bella. Thank you, Stella Bella. Spencer Pierce. Thank you, Spencer Pierce. Sam B. Thank you, Sam B. Joni4729. Thank you, Joni4729. Augustberry Fog09. Thank you, Augustberry Fog09. James Moy. Thank you, James Moy. JT Northrop. Thank you, JT Northrop. Thank you to everyone helping support my channel. It absolutely means the world to me. If you'd like to help, there's a link to my Patreon page below, but please only join if you're comfortable doing so. New members get a personal thank you in the next regular video I upload after they join, as well as credits in each regular video for as long as they remain a member. If you recently joined and are not mentioned here, it's likely because your membership notice came after this was recorded. Rest assured, I'll get you next time. I'm still working out other possible benefits, so who knows what the future holds? I mean, if I did, I'd be playing the lottery. Today we meet the famous Speed Buggy! On the way to a seaside automobile rally, the gang are stranded in Winona, an almost deserted town plagued by a mysterious nightly wind. While there, they meet Speed Buggy and his human friends, and together the two groups work to unravel the secret. Speed Buggy was yet another Hanna-Barbera Scooby-Doo clone clogging up Saturday morning television in the 1970s. Instead of four teenagers and a talking dog, Speed Buggy featured three teenagers and a talking automobile. Debbie was a cross between Fred and Daphne, as she was the leader and the cute girl, while Mark was a cross between Fred and Velma, as he was the beefy one with the brains. Mark's depiction here is confusing, though. On his own show and in the title card, he's depicted as Caucasian, but in the episode itself, he has a much darker coloring, making him appear as either Native American, Hispanic, or Black. I wish Hanna-Barbera had this much diversity at the time, but I'm guessing this was once again just another of the many, many production mistakes they kept making. If the artists don't respect model sheets, why should the colorists respect color code numbers? Tinker was clearly the shaggy of the team, with Speed Buggy himself rounding out the group as the Scooby analog, and their relationship was obviously meant to mirror that of the more famous duo. Because Hanna-Barbera seemed somewhat obsessed at times with the Andy Griffith show, it should be mentioned that Tinker was clearly inspired by Gomer Pyle in his physical design, southern accent, and fondness for saying, GOLLY, much like how Jim Neighbors did. There's only one car in the world that could have done that. Speed Buggy! Wow! Aren't you Velma, Daphne, Fred, and Shaggy? What the hell? What's going on here? When did the Scooby Gang become famous? I can accept them knowing who Speed Buggy and the rest are because they're a famous racing team, but what the hell is going on with Debbie, Mark, Tinker, and Speed Buggy knowing who the gang are? Is Scooby Doo a TV show in the Speed Buggy universe? Does the new Scooby-Doo movies take place in the world of Scooby Goes Hollywood, where the gang are just actors on a set? <laughs> what? Oh, oh, no way! Go on, Scoob, it's only a car! That talks? That's a strange question from a dog that talks. Someone just said it again. I don't know if my nerves are going to be able to handle this episode. It's getting way too existential for my taste. This may legitimately be the creepiest episode of Scooby-Doo I've ever seen. Yikes! Tinker, look out! That's bad! So who was on the wrong side of the road here? Because both vehicles appear to be driving in the center of the street. Where are you guys headed? The Oceanside Car Rally, same as you. Hey, why don't we go together? Terrific! Wait a minute. If the Mystery Machine and Speed Buggy were heading to the same location, why did they almost run into each other coming from opposite directions? Tinker, is it true you can operate Speed Buggy by remote controls? Sure can, Velma. 
I don't understand why a sentient car would need a remote control. Can't Tinker just say something like, Speed buggy, go down the road a mile, then turn around and come back. Or does this work like a shock collar for dogs, and if Speed Buggy doesn't do what he's told... <laughs> wow. That got dark. The room is in zoom! It's not enough to terrify poor Scooby by constantly exposing him to criminals wearing monster and ghost disguises. Let's force him into a ridiculously overmodified dune buggy and have it spin around the street at high speeds with no driver or seatbelts. Worst dog owners ever. I'm sorry I backed out in front of you kids. Are you all right? What the hell is Milo Meekly doing here? Why isn't he still in prison after his arrest for the gold smuggling operation back when the gang met Sonny and Cher? All kidding aside, it's almost amazing how much Hanna-Barbera's penny-pinching resulted in nearly every episode recycling earlier character models, such as Farmer Duncan here being identical to Meekly. And there's still more of that to come in this episode. Welcome to Winona, population 10. Golly, it looks like Winona is deserted. Did Fred park on the opposite side of the road to read that sign? I guess it's lucky there's no traffic, huh? The villain this time around is the town's bank president, PJ Peabody, who, along with his three henchmen, used a powerful wind machine to drive the residents out of Winona in order to purchase all the land cheaply. Though it's unclear what he planned on doing with the real estate once he owned it. What's going on? Well, it seems like someone was trying to scare everybody out of town and get their property dirt cheap. And after everybody sold out and left, they were going to change Winona into that. In other scooby doo universe land swindles, there's almost always a definite goal. Miner 49er wanted the oil under his employer's ranch, while Space Kook and the Ghost of the Red Baron wanted to sell farmland to the government. Peabody's map made it appear his plan was to redevelop the town, but there wasn't any reason given as to why it had to be Winona. There was no mention of any local tourist attractions or even gambling to draw in visitors, so it's difficult to determine the merits of this scheme. Speaking of which, why wind? This is one of the more bizarre plots I've seen in a Scoopy episode. Wind itself isn't spooky, so Peabody probably should have added more to the story to sell it. He could have spread rumors of an ancient Native American legend of a vengeful wind spirit angry at the city residents for encroaching on sacred lands, or even added a spooky mist that would help play up the eeriness. Although that would have essentially been rehashing the unexplained fog from the second Don Knotts episode, but at least here the writers would have explained how the bad guys made it. If anything, the villain should have cranked up the power of the wind machine, or installed more than one of them, and then wrecked the town. Constantly replacing roof shingles and windows would make people want to sell out more quickly than a strong nightly breeze. Then again, the last thing Peabody would want would be insurance companies sending investigators to Winona to determine why there was such a large spike in claims being filed for wind damage. Perhaps one of the henchmen worked on a movie set and had access to a wind machine, and that was his suggestion when the group were brainstorming how to drive the residents out of town. I'm giving this design a 2 out of 5. Land swindles aren't original, the location of the town itself didn't appear to have anything going for it that made it worth stealing, and wind is just a baffling choice for spooking people. In the previous episode, there was a glut of costumes used by the villains. It's almost like the writers were prematurely making up for this episode's lack of any competent disguises. Hoods and robes again. Really. Hanna-Barbera wasn't even trying. Remember when I said that Farmer Duncan wasn't the only reused character model? Look at these guys. All four are dressed identically, and apart from the color, they're all clearly using the Mrs. Baker model from the first Batman and Robin episode. The artists didn't even bother setting Peabody apart by giving him a different outfit than his henchmen. I mentioned earlier the idea of inventing a Native American wind god, and I'm doubling down on that. The Scooby writers already used that concept several times before, like with Manu Tikitia or the Sharkmen, so there is precedent. 
Instead of hoods, capes, and robes, Peabody could have worn a headdress or medicine man outfit while his henchmen wrapped themselves up in cotton and pretended to be clouds. That at least would have fit a wind motif or been somewhat related to the location of Winona, a name derived from the language of the Dakota people. Wait a minute. Am I advocating for cultural appropriation here? Wow. That's just how irritated these costumes made me. And I'd have succeeded if it weren't for those meddling kids. You'll never get me! Wait a minute. Up to this point, there were just four bad guys in total. Now there's five? Let me check earlier. Yeah, just four. What about earlier? Now there's just three? What the hell? It's almost insulting how little thought was given to the villains this time around. Their outfits weren't unique. They weren't scary, they had no special effects, they had nothing to do with their scheme, nor even the location of their hideout. The only thing they had going for them was at least they had some color and weren't just painted a boring white. One out of five for their outfits. And I was this close to breaking my rule about not using a zero. By the time the Scooby and Speed Buggy groups arrived in Winona, the town was mostly deserted, which means that despite the inanity of the plan, Peabody and his gang had already nearly succeeded. So let's extrapolate from there and assume everyone did leave and the corrupt bank president was able to start buying up the land. In previous discussions, I said how awkward it would be for a villain to sit there at the closing table across from their victims while they bought their abandoned homes. If only one person remained in a location after everyone else was scared off by supernatural shenanigans, surely it'd be suspicious if that same person was desperately buying up all the real estate there. Don't call me Shirley. I suggested it would be a lot smarter for the bad guys to set up a corporation to do the actual buying so as to keep their involvement under wraps. In this episode, that's exactly what happened. Look at the back of this map. P.J. Peabody Development Corporation. The bank president? Except as seen by the plans the sheriff found at the end, Peabody had named his development company after himself, immediately linking him to the swindling plot with all the subtlety of Carl the Stuntman removing his mask in front of Shaggy's camera. F***ing Carl the Stuntman. <laughs> Out of business. Did they really need to walk up to the door to see the place was out of business? It wouldn't take long before the residents of Winona started asking themselves why Peabody not only remained in town when everyone else left out of fear of the wind, but he was also buying up everyone's vacant homes, commercial buildings, and farmland. Nobody buys worthless real estate, so it would have been clear that the bank president had to be privy to inside information. Setting all that aside, even the actions Peabody and his henchmen took kept hurting their scheme. Wow, spooks there. Now don't anybody panic. Why, why not? <laughs> For a change, a villain didn't jinx themselves by continuing their haunting when it wasn't necessary. As the town was still occupied by a handful of holdouts, Peabody and his henchmen needed to keep up the evening winds inadvertently catching the gang's attention. The villains can't even be blamed for the teenagers deciding to investigate the mystery because it was their concern for Farmer Duncan that pushed them in that direction. Let's see who's ringing the old church bell. <laughs> you mean like go through that cemetery? However, what was the point of ringing the bell in the abandoned church? Was Peabody trying to scare the kids away? Doing this just introduced a human element into the mystery of the winds. Up to that point, as far as the gang knew, the mystery winds could have been some hitherto unknown natural phenomena. Huh? Hey, there's somebody in there. Well, let's go after him. Another mistake was when Peabody or one of his henchmen allowed himself to be seen by the teenagers. Acting mysteriously and running away like this provided further evidence that the spooky goings-on in Winona was probably due to human machinations. From long experience, Fred and the rest knew if they kept pushing, eventually they'd find the solution to who was behind everything. There's someone who's not afraid. The 
bank is still open. I'm sorry I can't be of any help, kids. I'm as baffled as everyone else by what's happening. Why is the bank still open? Peabody's scheme depended on everyone being too scared to remain in Winona, and by this point the town was almost entirely deserted. Even setting aside the supernatural winds, if your business isn't going to have any customers, what's the point in keeping it open? That's strange. Sounds as if it's coming from the vault. In this situation, doing so made it worse for the villain because he was forced to escalate things by having the wind start appearing during the day in an attempt to scare the gang away. What was the point of locking up Shaggy and Scooby? Hey look! This is an old parchment map of the whole area. Hey look! There's a cave system under the mountain! Yeah! Maybe the winds come through the caves. If this was to try and prevent them from stumbling onto the old map of Winona County that showed the caverns under the city housing Peabody's hideout and the wind machine, locking them up in the same room with the map is bafflingly counterintuitive. In fact, why did the villains leave the map of the room to begin with? If you know there's documentation that might help expose your scheme, you get rid of that documentation. That would have made so much more sense than locking Shaggy and Scooby up with it. But because Peabody didn't dispose of the map, the gang were able to find the cave hideout. Where are we? Looks like some sort of office. Finally, Peabody and his henchmen managed to trap all the teenagers in a room at their hideout. Of all the abductions in Scooby-Doo, this might be one of the most successful for the villains because at least all the snoopers were accounted for. There was nobody left free who could go for help, and nobody in the outside world had any idea of the gang and the speed buggy crew's whereabouts. If Peabody was determined to make his plan a success, as grim as this sounds, he had the earth-moving equipment necessary to pile a bunch of stone and dirt in front of the door to permanently guarantee no one would ever be able to escape the room. A week or two without food and water would solve the meddling kids' problem. Of course, it might not even take that long. I mean, a sealed room with a running gasoline-powered automobile and nowhere for the carbon monoxide to go. Wow. That got... Dark. The kids did manage to escape using Speed Buggy's tunneling ability, so perhaps locking them up to slowly asphyxiate or starve may not have been viable. But if you're determined enough, the wind machine itself offered a solution. Those naked fan blades aren't exactly OSHA compliant, if you get my drift. Oh, I said nobody would know about the missing teenagers. However, I suppose there was always Farmer Duncan. The thing is, Peabody also knew of the old man's involvement from spying on him earlier, and it wouldn't take much to make him disappear as well. Peabody and his henchmen were bad guys, but even they had enough qualms not to resort to mass murder, thus dooming their plans the moment the gang smelled a mystery. Before wrapping this up, I'm going to take a moment to discuss the location of Winona. The Scooby fan site claims Winona is in Mississippi, but offers zero evidence for that claim and I found nothing in the episode that would back it up either. Unless I'm blind, and still deaf from that ear infection, no state is ever shown on any maps or road signs or mentioned by name. In real life, there is a Winona, Mississippi, but that is no reason to assume the one visited by the gang is the same as its real-world counterpart. If the city in question was Hollywood or Nashville, as seen in previous episodes, it's a safe bet we're talking about the more famous locales. Winona, Mississippi population 4,505, is no Hollywood or Nashville. Further, the only map we see in the episode with illegible writing indicates Winona sits in Winona County. Winona, Mississippi is located in Montgomery County. The geography is against the Mississippi theory as well, as throughout the episode, mountains, or at least very elevated ground, can be seen in the background. Mississippi is not exactly known for its rugged peaks and mountaineering industry. The only thing in the episode that comes close to supporting a Mississippi location is the fact that the gang were heading toward an event called the Oceanside Auto Rally. 
Real life Winona, Mississippi is just about four hours from the Gulf of Mexico. If determined to link Winona to a real-world counterpart, there is a town called Winona located in a county called Winona in Minnesota. It's also surrounded by plenty of high ground, as seen in the episode. However, being in Minnesota, it's not exactly a comfortable day's journey by car to anywhere that could reasonably call itself an Oceanside Auto Rally. The previous episode found the gang in Hollywood, so I prefer to think of Winona as being a fictional town in California because that state would offer both mountainous terrain and proximity to an ocean. And though California may not have been home to the Dakota tribe, which would account for the use of Winona as the name of the town, it's certainly a lot closer to where those people lived than Mississippi. This whole tangent boils down to not trusting everything you read on a fan-run wiki page. And Peabody's operation score boils down to a mere 2 out of 5. Initially successful, but poorly thought out and executed, and without the determination to do what needed doing. This leaves the four villains, yes four, with a do score of 1.7 out of 5. As bad as Chumley and Otto were, Peabody and his crew were just slightly worse. Oh no! Oh boy, lucky thing we brought our emergency rations, right Scoob? Right! I was going to poke fun at how Casey Kasem pronounced rations, but apparently rations is an accepted alternative according to the dictionary. I guess I'm the a here. Good night, all. They're just going to park the mystery machine right there on the road and camp out? And what happened to all the boards on the windows of the hotel? Who the hell sleeps on their arm above the pillow? Or is he on his shoulder and the drawing is just bad? I showed this to my wife, and we spent about five minutes debating what was going on. Those lousy animators. Ginger, look out! That's bad! Quit thinking, Speedy! Well, I guess not all self-driving cars are death traps, huh? I have room in the house for you girls, and the boys can bed down here in the barn. No hanky-panky allowed at Farmer Duncan's place. It's almost midnight. Where are the girls? It's almost midnight? With that much daylight? Instead of Mississippi, Minnesota, or California, maybe this episode took place in northern Alaska. down there, Shaggy? A way out! What else? Shaggy is awfully clean for having just fallen into a sewer. Where do we go from here? Now that all of the children are growing up. <laughs> I can't be the first person to wonder just how big Speed Buggy is supposed to be. He is essentially a car. Yes, technically a dune buggy, but he's obviously street legal and large enough to regularly seat at least three people comfortably. Yet we also see him constantly going in and out of buildings with human-sized entries. <laughs> Where the hell is his body? Like I'm with you. Hey, what's all the noise about? Man at work, Velma. Don't distract him. It's been said that if you're ever unsure if something someone says to a woman is sexist, imagine if they said that same thing to a man and see if it sounds the same. It would have been weird if Mark had said that to Fred, so I'm pretty sure that's sexist. F***ing 1970s. Come on, girls. While the boys are busy, let's go poke around the village. A village? Well, how are you going to get into the village? Why, Speed Buggy wants to take us. What do you think, Mark? Well, we'll get more work done if they're gone. Jesus Christ! Yeah, I think it's fair to say that Mark was definitely being sexist earlier. F***ing 1970s! I'm sorry I can't be of any help, kids. I'm as baffled as everyone else by what's happening. 
Now, if you'll excuse me, I must get back to my chocolate factory and prepare some death traps to teach life lessons to a handful of spoiled children. I hate to admit I'm licked, but I'm licked. Does hot dog water n No, 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 no. That's just too easy, and frankly, I'm sorry I even went there. Let's face it, we'd better get help. You two wait here in case they show up. I'll get help. Come on, Speedy. We gotta get the boys fast. Uh, did you check the nearest hamburger stand? The room is zoom. Debbie had left Daphne and Velma back in town. Golly, you mean like in a haunted house? Oh, come on, Tinker. One shaggy in this outfit is enough. Considering how the Speed Buggy show was created to be another Scooby-Doo clone, and Tinker was the shaggy equivalent, this line is eerily meta. Help's on the way! This looks like a job for Speed Buggy! That is clearly not the same padlock from when Shaggy and Scooby were originally trapped. Give me room! <laughs> I know I've been saying this a lot in this video, but what the hell? What is shooting out of Speed Buggy's tailpipe that it melts a steel padlock? Hydrochloric acid? Velma jokes that Speed Buggy is hot stuff, but if that really was just heat from his tailpipe, much of that wooden door should have been reduced to cinders. <laughs> that tickles, that tickles. <laughs> Why would Tinker give Speed Buggy a central nervous system? If he's sensitive enough to be tickled by paper, what the hell do high winds and road debris do to him? You know, while we're on the topic of Speed Buggy's design, he doesn't even have a windshield. Every bug, piece of dirt, and chunk of gravel is going to be slapping Debbie, Mark, and Tinker in the face every time they're on the highway. That's why my helmet had a visor when I used to ride a motorcycle. And perhaps it's because I also drive a convertible. Looking at Speed Buggy, I can't help but ask... What the hell do Debbie, Mark, and Tinker do when it rains? Do they just never drive when the weather report calls for bad weather? Or do they just get wet? I'll hook this tow cable on. Okay, Speed Buggy, do your thing! Oh boy, oh boy. This, this is tough. This is tough. You never hook a tow rope to a bumper. If it wasn't for cartoon physics, that bumper would be immediately ripped off and the mystery machine would be flying backward halfway down the mountain by now. What is it, an alligator? Please me. <laughs> then, then you're not doing it? Uh -uh. This is the second episode in a row that has a character making shadow puppets. <laughs> if this episode does take place in California, Speed Buggy breaking a stalactite here would be a misdemeanor a decade later. It's not like he can't fit in a jail cell. <laughs> How did he fit behind that door? Considering what Speed Buggy's tailpipe is capable of, those guys are lucky their faces aren't melting off. <laughs> Speedy, like you're a hero! Yeah, a hero! Oh, he's gaining on us! Wait a minute. We just saw Velma with Shaggy and Scooby riding inside Speed Buggy. How did she get here with Daphne being chased by one of the bad guys? Wait a minute. Where did all these people come from? They spent the entire first half of the episode establishing that everything was closed and the entire town was almost completely deserted except for the farmer and the bank president. And that's my ranking of the villains from the third set of episodes of the second season of the new Scooby-Doo movies, shown here along with the ones from my previous videos. Both bad guys this time around were pretty lackluster. So stay tuned to my channel to see if the series can redeem itself with the last two episodes. I hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. If you'd like to help support this channel, there's a link to my Patreon below, but please only join if you're comfortable doing so. I mean, it's obvious I'm not missing any meals.